Okay. So, thank you everybody for being to be there for the first session of our seminar in metaphysics, uh, meta metaphysics and sciences. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, reintroduce a good friend of the CFSS, uh, Pierre Saint Gerbier. He used to be a postdoc here with uh, Peter in uh, Logic. He is now a senior researcher in uh, IRCAM, at uh, Sorbonne University, working in uh, philosophy of music, musicology, and still doing a lot of logic and metaphysics as well. And uh, here he will talk for us about uh, Lumos Maxim, Imperial Nationality, and the strangest, Strangeness of Impossibility. Yeah, so it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So I'm very happy to be uh, back here and to have been invited uh, in the Meta Metaphysics, in a new Meta Metaphysics seminar, which is a big change for me because I'm, I was more used to, uh, to the logic seminar at the CFSS, but I will try to meet the demands of uh, this uh, Meta Metaphysics. So at first I was a bit uh, anxious about what I could present because I haven't done much recent work in meta -metaphys metaphysics to the extent that I have ever done any serious work in meta metaphysics. But after I think I opened Thomas Taco's recent handbook of meta metaphysics and I saw that the epistemology of meta of modality was part of meta metaphysics. So I guess this talk, which is mostly a talk in the epistemology of modality. Uh, with a slight formal bent uh, will do the trick. And I, I try to provide examples of it, uh, relevant to metaphysics and the philosophy of science. I hope we might be able to discuss more of the examples during the Q&A. Uh, so uh, this is the outline of the talk, uh, but this is usually, this should be a very natural flow. I will explain what my problem is and how I, I try to solve it, what the challenges are, how I, I meet those challenges. Uh, let me start with Hume's maxim. So there are many things Hume said, so you might have heard of Hume's dictum, uh, which is something about um, necess uh, necessary uh, existence. Uh, Hume's maxim is about the connection between uh, conceivability and possibility. Uh, so this is the famous uh, quote from the treatise of human nature. It is an established maxim in metaphysics that whatever the mind clearly conceives includes the idea of possible existence, or in other words, that nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. Um, so I don't think this idea of uh, reasoning about possibility uh, by means of continuity is completely original to Hume, and he doesn't claim it to be original. He says that it's an established maxim, and we can find it uh, in other authors in early modern philosophy before him, especially Descartes. But he was the one, at least he was one of those who put it in a very uh, uh, clear uh, formulation that served as a basis for discussion. So I'm going to simplify it a lot and excuse this for the uh, scholars of early modern philosophy because I put away very interesting stuff like uh, clear conceivability, uh, clear and distinct ideas. Uh, I would love to be able to say more stuff on that. Uh, at some point I had ideas about how to cash out uh, formally, but for the sake of simplicity, I will leave that uh, away uh, and just talk about conceivability Simplicita. And so the kind of things I will be interested, I will be discussing today is connection between conceivability and possibility. So basically, there are two questions here. First, what does it mean? What is the meaning of that maxim? Which means, which entails answering the question, what does conceivability mean? And of course, is it true? Uh, and I will not give, like, of course, like, conclusive answer to, those, to both questions, but I will approach both questions first by giving a sort of uh, a formal explication of conceivability, which builds on uh, tools that are not original to me, but I think the, the final formalization is original to me, at least uh, I haven't seen it anywhere else in the literature. And uh, I, I will have something to say, not about whether it's absolutely true, but in, in which conditions it's true and in which conditions it fails. The idea being that if we master those conditions, then we can use it in an interesting sense epistemologically. So you don't need to say that it's true in order to say that it's epistemologically useful. So this will be one of the, of the, of the main points I will try to make. Um, I'm going to bring some context. I think Hume's maxim. So a lot of people hate it. 
Uh, a lot of people have criticized it since the beginning. Uh, um, so um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Reed, after you, after Hume just criticized uh, Hume's maxim, uh, and there are a lot of recurrent arguments that you can find by authors. But still, um, as Yabo pointed out in his famous paper, his considerability guide to possibility. There's this kind of schizophrenia here because a lot of philosophers are prone to say, ah, well, of course, the fact that it's conceivable does not mean that it's possible. But explicitly or implicitly, this sort of move is used all the time in philosophy. Because it's very hard to give uh, uh, a direct argument for a possibility, for a non-obvious possibility. And conceivability is one of the tools. At, so now the epistemology of modality has developed and uh, by no means conceivability accounts are the dominant account or even the only account. So there are a lot of alternative accounts. Uh, for the sake of uh, time, I will, my talk is only focused about uh, Hume's maxims. It's not that I disregard all the other accounts as promising, not at all. Uh, but it turns out that this is what I want, what I've been talking about and what I have to say. And I think there are still things to say about Hume's maxims. So I'll try to say them today. Uh, just give examples uh, um, of uses of Hume's maxim in the recent, um, the recent literature. Of, of course, the famous example is, uh, is uh, Chalmers' uh, zombie argument. So here, uh, the phi, uh, you can, the big phi uh, could be read as the total description of all the physical facts. And the psi could be thought as the big psi as the complete descriptions of all the psychological facts. So uh, conceiving uh, that the big phi holds and the uh, and not big psi holds is like conceiving a zombie world, a world which is exactly, physically exactly like ours, but with no phenomenal uh, consciousness at all. Um, and then you use the move from conceivability of possibility to uh, say that if it's if zombie worlds are, are if a zombie world is conceivable then it's possible and if it's possible of course it's uh, physicalism is false because physicalism at, at at least entails the supervenience of the phenomenal property on the physical property so if it's possible to have uh, all the physical facts and none of the uh, phenomenal facts then of course uh, physicalism is false Peter, I see you uh, frowning, so I guess I said something wrong or no, not clear enough. I'm just a bit surprised. So, so phi is um, all physical facts. Actual, psi, actual physical facts. Psi, all actual phenomenal facts. Uh, maybe I said psychological, that was a slip yeah. of the tongue. I meant phenomenal, so facts about what appears to. Uh, to people, or you can restrict it to yourself if you. Uh, so it's possible that all the physical facts hold, the actual physical facts, none of the phenomenal, and therefore physicalism is false. Yes, because if physicalism is true, then uh, the, the phenomenal is part of the physical world. So, or at least is necessitated by it, or it supervenes on it. So you cannot have a, a, a phenomenal difference without a physical difference. Or it's all illusion. Then it's a sort of eliminative physicalism, maybe. But but then the if it's an illusion, then the psi is empty. Uh, well, this this was this was meant as an argument for not not directed at as people who believe it's. it's uh, you accept the phenomenal. Yeah, exactly. Who want yeah those sort of physicalists who believe phys phenomenal facts are supervenient on. Uh, Physical facts. Second sort of uh, examples. So in in the in the zombie argument, uh, the move from conceivability to possibility is explicit. So Chalmers makes that move and he spends a lot of energy uh, giving a theory that uh, justifies that, that particular move. The other case is where the move is merely implicit. So here I I give um, a reconstruct logical reconstruction of the structure of thought experiments at least. A wild class of thought experiments. Uh, there's a, there's a, a literature on this. Uh, so I give the, the, the final reconstruction by Mulder and Muller, uh, which is a slight improvement on the Hequist original model. 
But the idea is that uh, a lot of thought experiments are used to destroy uh, uh, theories or to, or to criticize theories by showing that some things are, uh, there are some possibilities that are incompatible with the original theory. So that's uh, the main idea, but in the details, what you need in order to, uh, to have a, a thought experiment is a theory. So here I would try to run the example with a Schrodinger's cat. I hope I don't say anything uh, too inexact about the physics. Um, so S is supposed to be the Copenhagen interpretation of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, the content possibility is a scenario uh, described by Schrodinger, where you have a, a radioactive substance uh, with a decay within an hour, connected to a, a Geiger counter, connected to a, a flask of poison, uh, which explodes if a particle comes out. And uh, as soon as uh, the poison explodes, it uh, intoxicates the cat who dies instantaneously. Um, then you have a conditional which says that uh, Copenhagen interpretation entails that uh, if uh, that possibility uh, were the case, then the cat would be both, uh, uh, I mean, in a superposed state of being both uh, uh, alive and dead. Uh, of course, in that scenario, it's not the case uh, that the cat is, uh, is, uh, is both uh, alive and dead, it has to be one or the other. And then you have a bridge that connects the two, uh, the two counterfactuals, which is required for the, uh, to have, a, to have a, an inconsistency. But when you get, you get all the pieces uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of, this, uh, of the thought experiment, uh, you have an incompatibility between the possibility of C and uh, the theory. So usually you, uh, the fact that the scenario is the possible scenario is used at the end of the day in order to refute uh, theory S. The obvious question is how do you know that the scenario is possible? And then um, there's a case to be made that implicitly what gives plausibility to the scenario or plausibility to the claim that the scenario is indeed possible is the fact that you have described it in very clear terms, which means that you have applied the method of considerability. You have provided a clear and distinct uh, description of the scenario. You see no inconsistency, everything is clear. It seems that something that could happen, even though it's, uh, it might be difficult to break about for technical reasons, but in principle, this should be uh, possible. Um, so, that's basically uh, uh, part of the schizophrenia. So the, uh, each time we, we, we run thought experiments or we actually uh, are convinced by thought experiments, it seems like we use Hume's maxim in one way or on the other. So we better, uh, so if you want to evaluate thought experiments, uh, we better know uh, if Hume's maxim is uh, a good, a good, a good methodological principle. At least we need to know when it works and when it doesn't work. Um, then I say, uh, so that's for the for the for the context. Then um, uh, just a, a small note uh, for the aficionados about hyperintentionality. It's just a, an additional constraint that I put on the, the explication of considerability. Uh, which some people find interesting, like me, but I guess not everyone uh, find interesting, but I and convinced that it's actually important to have a, a hyperintentional notion of uh, conceivability. So first, uh, uh, hyperintentionality is a phenomenon that, that uh, you observe. Uh, so hyperintentionality is a fact that contents that are necessarily equivalent uh, are not always intersubstitutable. And uh, usually they're not substitutable in contexts which are about <coughs> mental representation and considerability is about uh, mental representation if anything is, so you would expect it to be hyperintentional. Uh, so what does it mean? So for example, when we say that uh, belief contexts are hyperintentional, it means that when things are necessarily equivalent, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to believe one if you believe the other. Uh, and there are other properties, but the first one is a, is a basic, is a, is a most basic property. And um, and so there are interactions because between the claim that uh, uh, between human maxims and the hyperintentionality of uh, considerability. 
So if you assume, for example, that uh, conceivability is intentional but not hyperintentional, and with a very uh, basic assumption about uh, the logic of necessity, you can derive the fact that uh, if one necessity is conceivable, then all necessities are conceivable. So if you uh, if you uh, if uh, conceivability is not hyperintentional, then you will have this sort of bad results for the sake of modeling conceivability. It will be, I think, highly uh, inadequate. Uh, in case you doubt that uh, not all necessities are conceivable if one is. So here is an, is an example uh, based on the Galileo's um, paradox of, uh, it's one of the paradoxes of infinity. So apparently uh, Galileo was not able to, uh, to uh, to apply notions like equality, uh, having a, a larger number or a, a smaller number for infinite collections, but you could apply it to uh, finite collections. So there, so there, but both are mathematical necessities, if anything is. So there are case, things that, uh, so, there are, so Galileo could conceive at least one necessity and could not conceive another one. Uh, in order, if you want to model this kind of stuff, you need a hyperintentional notion of um, hyperintentionality. Um, so now there's a lot of interest in um, in hyperintentionality, but it means that the the common uh, reflex, which, which is to use the standard tools of model logic, will not uh, take you very far. You need to uh, employ some uh, other resources. Um, now, I will uh, describe two challenges against Hume's maxim, one coming from Graham Priest, another one coming from Franz Berthaud and uh, Tom Schonen. Um, so we start with the Priest challenge. Um, so Priest starts with the idea that uh, he claims to be able to conceive everything that is describable in uh, in understandable terms, and actually, this is a this is a criticism that you already find in um, in Reed right after Hume. Um, um, and then, obviously, uh, a lot of like impossibilities can be described in meaningful terms. You don't need to be like uh, always confused in your language when you describe impossibilities. It rains now. It rains now in Nouvelle-Anneuve, and it doesn't rain now in Nouvelle-Anneuve. Understand perfectly what is to rain. Understand perfectly negation. Understand perfectly conjunction. And I just like assert an impossibility. Um, and so there are. I, I gave like a very mundane examples, but there are a lot of like more like theoretically interesting examples, like mathematical falsehood. Uh, so if you take, for example, Goldbach's conjecture and its negation, it seems like we can understand both. We can, we conceive both in that like weak sense, but apparently one is true and the other is, is not. At least they are both not false. Um, when you conceive, I mean, if you were like a logical monist, you believe there's only one true logic, but you can still reason according to alternative logics. So it seems like uh, in those cases, you um, describe impossible reasonings. Uh, yet, if the logics are well defined, uh, there's nothing you don't understand there. It's possible to describe in consistent state of affairs. That's what I did with the rain example. Um, you have inconsistent fictions, and of course, Chris is very happy to cite his own example of uh, the uh, the short story about the um, Sylvan's box. I was about to say the Rootley star, but now it's the other thing. It's the Sylvan box. Um, so with the, the box, which is both empty and uh, and non-empty, basically, if I remember correctly, the story. Yes. And uh, for all these reasons, so if you can conceive the impossible straight away like that, then of course, Hume's maxim is false. Of course, this is just like the beginning of a, of a dialectic, uh, because of course the proponents of Hume's maxim will uh, will respond a number of things to this. Um, so one thing that you find in literature is the idea that alleged impossibilities are really misdescribed possibilities. So each time you have any possibility, you can redescribe it in a certain way so that it's a possibility. And I will give 
So it does not apply for all uh, the counter examples to Jung's maxim, but it applies to a significant one, and I will see in a significant class of counter examples, and I will uh, discuss it a bit uh, later. So please uh, stay tuned. Uh, another uh, rejoinder is the idea that um, conception is confused with supposition. So we can suppose impossible stuff, and that's things we do when it's time we do a reduction at absurdum. Uh, but conception is something uh, different. Uh, it's uh, a stronger uh, attitude that requires more than just uh, supposition. So that's one possible way. But then the onus of someone who says that is to give like a clear characterization of what additional ingredients did in conception in addition to uh, supposition. And I mean, the, the second point directly or like leans toward the third point, which is that um, the alleged conceivable, conceived impossibilities are not conceived in the right sense uh, required by Jung's maxim. Uh, and if you say that, then it's on you to provide that clear sense. So I guess it's on me today, uh, because that's the kind of challenge I will try to, uh, to meet. So regarding this idea of misdescribed um, uh, Impossibilities. So it's related to, uh, of course, the, the, the work of Kripke. So I, I just have one slide here. Uh, we can we could talk about it for like a whole a whole semester. But the idea is that uh, in the reasonings that move from conceivability to, possi to, to possibility, uh, we, when it's done with certain things or certain or certain vocabulary certain sort of concepts, then we are prone to make confusions. So here I wanted to spare uh, my audience with the uh, example of water and H2O, because I know I have one philosopher of chemistry here that will like cry if I, if I use that example. So I used instead an example about proper names of jazz musicians, because I like jazz. Um, so as you may know, Abdullah Ibrahim uh, is just uh, the same jazz musician, jazz pianist as Dollar Brand. So the South African uh, jazz pianist just like became famous as Dollar Brand and then converted to Islam. And he became known as um, Abdullah Ibrahim. And it's actually, if you don't know that, you can actually at some point learn, ah, oh, Abdullah Ibrahim is Dollar Brand. A Dollar Brand, just like you learn that Esperus is phosphorus. Except that you don't really learn it because you read about it when you read freely, except this can happen in real life. It's how it happened to me actually. Uh, so then, uh, this, is, this can be the basis of a counterexample to, uh, to Jung's maxim because before I had this formation, it seems like I could conceive. Actually, I believe that Abdullah Ibrahim is not Dollar Brand, so I, for sure, yeah, you might think I, I could conceive it. But of course, it's impossible because they are the same person. Uh, of course, this all has to do with the, with the semantics of proper names, the fact they are, that they are um, uh, rigid designators. And what another way to describe what is happening or to describe the contents of my conception is that it's a different sort of argument. So the first argument is like, is, is, a, is it valid? Uh, two premise for conclusion. But the second argument um, uh, says that I can conceive that the author of African Marketplace, which is one famous record of Abdullah Ibrahim, recorded under the name of Abdullah Ibrahim, is not the author of Children of Africa, which is a famous record of Dollar Brand. So, of course, you could imagine a situation where you have two jazz musicians who basically, the first of one has exactly the, the life and the output of Dollar Brand, and the second one has exactly the life and the output of, of, uh, of Abdullah Ibrahim. And you can imagine that they are uh, the same, and the, and the result for the history of jazz is exactly the same. Uh, you have the same performances and the same records under the same name at the same time. Uh, and of course, it's possible that to have this dissociation, something that could have happened. Uh, and so this argument is valid. But what, uh, so what the mistake that people do when they uh, do the argument from one to two is either that they, 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 they confuse, they misdescribe uh, the possibility they really conceive, which is a possibility that the author of African Marketplace is not the author of Children of Africa. But they, 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 they describe it as the fact, as, as, as the fact that Abdullah Ibrahim is not Dollar Brown, which is not what you're conceiving, you're conceiving something different. 
And it's because of this misdescription that you get into error. But if you describe things correctly, uh, you either not conceive that Abdullah Ibrahim is not a Labrand, and then you, you don't feel the pressure to conclude that it's possible that Abdullah Ibrahim is not a Labrand, or what you conceive is just that the author of, of, of African Marketplace is not the author of Children of Africa, and then it's okay for you uh, to conclude that it's possible that the author of African Marketplace is not the author of uh, Children of Africa, but then you have not concluded that it's possible that Abdullah Ibrahim is not a Brown. So each time you have an inference to uh, an impossibility, can you place it with an inference to a possibility described in slightly different terms? And the reason why there's a possibility of, con of confusion is because of some semantic features of proper names, uh, which is that they are uh, rigid designators, so they uh, refer to the same individual in all possible worlds. But we, when we use them, we associate to them uh, descriptive content, which is contingent, which holds only for the actual world. And, that's, and when we confuse the two, uh, we can make those model errors. This is a, this is a very broad topic. Uh, I, I gave a very schematic presentation of it. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of elaborations of these ideas, uh, of, the, of these models. So basically, two-dimensional semantics is a way uh, to clarify this picture by having two dimensions of meaning, primary intentions, secondary intentions. Uh, I won't go uh, into those details, I don't need to. What I want to point out is that this sort of uh, counterexamples to Jung's maxim, which have attracted a lot, of, a lot of attention, they are directed to semantic explanation. Uh, and uh, this will be uh, uh, interesting for later because in the picture that I'm going to propose, semantics is not as central uh, as it is there, in the sense that those kinds of cases can be accounted by model, model principles, which are only contingent, contingently associated to semantic uh, features. It's not, what is happening here is not prim primarily semantic, uh, which gives, a, I think, a different picture of uh, model error than the one that is uh, uh, greatly discussed in the literature. Uh, so here we come to uh, the conclusion of, uh, of Priest, which is that we have a dilemma. Uh, either we understand the notion of conceivability as, uh, as he understands it, which is something that I can describe uh, in terms I understand, and then Jung's maxim is false. Or you need more to conceive than just uh, uh, a clear understanding, clear linguistic understanding, but then the thing you need to add to get to, to use Maxim amounts to, I mean, there's a risk that what you add is just being possible or being logically possible. And if that's what you need in order to conceive something to know that it's already possible, then you are in the risk of uh, uh, turning the Maxim into a tautology. And it basically means that if something is possible, then it's possible. And something that which is useless, because you don't gain anything from moving from conceivability to uh, possibility if possibility is required for conceivability. So perhaps there's some other notion of uh, conceivability that satisfies Hume's maxim, but uh, doesn't know how to articulate it. So there's a challenge here. There's a dilemma and a challenge, and I take the challenge. Uh, I will briefly mention another uh, dilemma, which is a bit different and a bit more focused on the constraints uh, or the tools that, or the ingredients that you, we might use in order to characterize conceivability. So it's a bit more focused on the analysis of conceivability. So it's from a paper uh, by Berto and Jenner. Actually, it's not forthcoming. Uh, I'm sorry, I just like, um, I just copy pasted the, the big tech file on the field papers. And I guess the file was generated while the paper was for, forthcoming, but I think it was published several years ago, probably around, 2016, I would say. So apologies to uh, Hans and Tom for this paper exists, you can read it. I mean, and it's a good paper, uh, you should read it. If you're interested in Jung's Maxim. So basically they, they have, uh, actually it's not really a dilemma, it's more like a tetra lemma. Uh, so basically they, they consider all the, so they, they made an argument based on the, the psychology, the cognitive theory you might have of conceivability. It's based on the idea uh, from the literature on uh, mental representations that there are 
basically two sorts of formats that are used by uh, philosophers of psychology and psychologists when they want to theorize about imagination. So we have uh, ling so linguistic, linguistic code, which is the, the, sim the symbolic code that is familiar from the, um, uh, so Fodor's language of thought hypothesis. So the idea that information is encoded, is encoded in the mind uh, symbolically. Or you have the hypothesis that uh, information is encoded in the mind uh, pictorially. So this is another uh, scientific hypothesis that has been defended by Gosling uh, in the, ima in the uh, imagery debate. Of course, you could have a mixture of the two or something different or, or something else altogether different. So we have four options. And they, uh, they consider each option and uh, uh, each time they say that it's bad for Hume's maxim. So uh, if it's linguistic only, then basically we're in, in this, so that they claim, and then here I disagree and I explain later why, they claim that basically we're in a similar situation as uh, in the priest uh, argument, which is that uh, we can represent linguistically almost anything, also including possibilities. So uh, if it's linguistic only, then uh, Hume's vaccine will be false. This is a very schematic uh, presentation. Uh, doesn't do justice to all the details of the argumentation of the authors, but that's basically the, the bottom line. Yes? What do they mean by everything? Well, everything is... Uh, no, that's that's a good... Uh, no, that's what I mean. I, I don't think I took that from them. That's What I mean is that... Um, no, no. Uh, yeah, this sentence uh, doesn't make much sense. Thanks, Peter, for uh, pointing that out. What is meant here is that um, because it's, I was about to say everything linguistic, so everything linguistically representable would be conceivable. So that's what I meant. That's not what I wrote, but that's what I meant. So including impossibilities because they are linguistically representable or representable, like encodable by symbolic means in the mind. So if you believe that thought, uh, if you follow and you believe that thought is um, is productive. If you have a, if you have in the language in the language of thought, you have a sentence that corresponds to grains here in Ivanov. Now uh, you have a, you have the sentence that corresponds to its negation, and you have the sentence that corresponds to conjunction of the sentence and its negation. And so this is something that is encoded linguistically in the mind under under that view. Of course, it's impossible. So that's that's the idea. It's a rough idea. Uh, so if it's imagistic only, it's, it's not completely useless, but it's of very limited use because the sort of content that can be represented purely imagistically are very limited. It's about basically shapes uh, in space to be very quick and you will not get a very far uh, if you want to apply that to the philosophical arguments, for example. Maybe you can use Hume's maxim if you want to simulate in your mind uh, how to move your piano from uh, your living room to your dining room, but nothing much more than that. Uh, you, have the, you have the possibility of a combination of the two, and then you have to look at the way uh, the linguistic and the imagistic representation interact. And then there are issues that have to do with the fact that uh, basically either, uh, so the imagistic representation does not completely constrain the kind of uh, linguist, more informative linguistic representation you can apply on top of it, which means there's, a, there's an element of arbitrariness, and if there's arbitrariness, then it's easy to uh, conceive impossibilities in this way. Uh, for the sake of time, I, I won't go into the details, but so the example here is you can imagine uh, Mohamed Ali, or uh, someone who looks like Mohamed Ali uh, doing a, a, a boxing uh, fight against uh, Mohamed Ali, and you say, oh, I have imagined that Mohamed Ali uh, fights again Cassius Clay. Uh, and this is something that is impossible because they are the same person and they cannot, uh, they cannot, you cannot do a boxing fight with yourself. Um, so, according to one, at least one prominent theories of the way linguistic and imagistic uh, representations interact, something you can easily get. And so this is bad for use, Maxim. And then you can say, well, some, no conceivability is something different from those three options. But then it becomes mysterious and you don't know how to make it work. So here again, you have a, like a tetralemma, if you will, and a challenge to provide a, the right explication of uh, conceivability. Yes. 
sorry if this is going to, this is not helpful and I know the answer, obviously. Uh, but what does it mean for conceivability to be linguistic or imagistic? Like, what is even the, 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 the subject of, of conceivable? What, what are the things that might be conceivable? Are they class states? Or, um, and if they are, like, wouldn't that, like, wouldn't you have another notion of conceivable if it's imagistic, like applying to different kind of objects? Um, like, what are we talking about here? So we are talking about, so the idea is to have like a, um, uh, so we all agree that conceivability is a sort of mental act. We have psychological, is a mental act. Conce conceivability is something that involves some sort of mental representation. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are some like psychological theories about how uh, mental representations work. Uh, informed by theoretical arguments given by philosophers of mind and informed by empirical research uh, given by psychologists. And so there's a kind of agreement that there, there are two main candidates for the sort of code or medium by means of which uh, the mind and the brain, to a certain extent, represent information. Either it's symbolic, which means that there's an element of arbitrariness and you can have sort of like uh, syntactic like structure, or it's imagistic. And then uh, it has a, it's based on resemblance and it has a, a particle structure that is isomorphic to the target of the representation, which is not the case with a linguistic like representation. So th those are like options that are in the theoretical options when you want to give a theory of mental representation. And if conceivability is a sort of pre mental representation or evolves mental representation, the, you, you would have to situate it. Yeah. So the problem is what involves uh, so its ability to conceive and the conception itself might be logistic or linguistic. Exactly. But there's this modal operator added to it. Yeah. Which makes me doubt like um, it's not because conception might be a very logistic thing. Whatever that means that, that that's the thing that I'm able to conceive well, the, 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 the majestic. No, 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 no. Well, I think the, the no, the, the the I think the 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 format of the representation constrains the content to a certain extent. It's not completely orthogonal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's very hard to uh, to represent majestically some very abstract contents. Um, um, at least that's the idea be behind the point number two. Uh, we can describe by linguistic means, uh, we can make conceptual distinctions between things that are uh, totally identical uh, in terms of how they appear to the eye, for example, or to the, the senses. Something that uh, so you would require a linguistic like code to make those distinctions and you would probably not be able to make them if you have purely imagistic code with that you might be able to make them if you have imagistic plus linguistic mm -hmm. so there's a there's an interaction between the content and the format to a certain extent yeah well, i'll leave for questions okay <laughs> So uh, this brings me to my problem, which is to find an explication of conceivability which fits, which is at least um, true to the intended meaning of Hume's maxim, which is hyperintentional because that's one constraint I gave on the formal modeling. And so I don't want to put uh, the constraint that it's true because I don't, uh, I don't think that Hume's maxim is like a universal truth, but at least explains how it can be used and how it can be used at least sometimes profitably in philosophical and scientific practice. And so the first step is to uh, put a filter on the available candidates in order to rule out uh, the, pre the, the pre starting point, which is conceivability, justice, understanding things, phrasing, uh, 
in um, in understandable terms. And uh, um, so basically, that's one refinement of uh, of priest. If I can understand all the logical parts of the syntactic part of phi, then I can consider phi. So this is what automatically takes you to the fact that you can conceive contradictions. Uh, if each member of the contradiction is easy to conceive and, you, and it just involves negation and conjunction. Uh, and, so, and then it says, well, when something is conceived, it may not even appear to be possible. But the problem is that this appearance of to be possible is what conceivability is supposed to convey. And uh, in the discussion of, in the, among the philosophers who have tried to give an explication of conceivability, they say, well, if you want to, to distinguish the, the uses of the verb, the, 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 um, the, the verb con to conceive or, or the adjective conceivable, which, which are relevant to humans maxim and all that are not, need to focus on, the, on those that are uh, accompanied by an appearance of possibility. So this is a point that made by Yablo uh, in, the, in his uh, seminal paper. And I think this is completely right. So if uh, conceivability does not even uh, provide an appearance of possibility, whatever that is, uh, then it's not conceivability in the way that is intended by Hume and the humans here. So any explanation of conceivability should, should be able to at least uh, account for that. So mere uh, uh, linguistic understanding would not be sufficient. And for the same reason, mere, uh, 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 the mere fact that we have a, like a, a symbolic or linguistic-like representation in our minds will not suffice. Um, so then Yablo provides his own uh, uh, explanation, which he calls uh, philosophical conceivability, and he says, P is conceivable for me if I can imagine a world I take to verify P. It's not very clear what he, what he means, like this to be a possible world or an impossible world, which is unfortunate <laughs> because, but either way, it's problematic because if, if, it's, uh, if it has to be, if it has to be a possible world, then we, we are back into a pre-cinema. We need to know it's, I mean, being possible is part of what it needs to be considerable. So you might say this is less. And if it can be any world, uh, then uh, then it might be false because I mean, it's not, it could not be generally true. So this not, does not really help. Uh, so what, um, what might help? So the thing I propose, which is ironically based on some things that uh, Franz Berthaud proposed as a logic of imagination. So the idea is to twist it and to use it in order to construct a notion of conceivability that under certain condition uh, meets uh, the meaning and uh, the explanatory, the, the, not the explanatory, but the dialectic uses of Hume's maxim. So this is where the formal part arrives. And uh, I can see that uh, I don't have much time left, so I will try to uh, be quick. But my goal here is to convey the main idea if you're curious about the details, maybe we can discuss them in the, the Q&A. So the, the important idea, and I think this is a very important insight uh, from, uh, from Franz Berthaud, is the idea that uh, we can, when we reason, I mean, there are many ways to, to, to formally explicate the notion of imagination or conceiving, but one fruitful way is to uh, approach it as a binary thing, as something that involves uh, a starting point or an explicit uh, input and an enrichment of that input that gives an output that is richer. Uh, so for example, um, and uh, the input is what is under vol voluntary control, is something that can be initiated, something that can be started, and the output is everything that goes with it. It's not that it's not something that goes with it by pure logical necessity. Uh, it's so, a sort of enrichment that is that, you, that is constrained in some way, but not by uh, purely logical necessitation or by purely logical consequence. Uh, I give an example right away. So this is the way to be formalized. So the thing between bracket is the input, and the, the thing afterwards is the output. So the, on the left is the explicit part, which is voluntarily started, and the thing that is in the output is the thing that follows implicitly from it. So here's an example. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Axel, he's not a hipster at all. 
but uh, I can conceive that. Uh, uh, so I can say, okay, let's let's imagine or let's try to conceive what Axel would be as a hipster. Uh, then, so what? So the input is Axel is a hipster, and the output is something like it's richer than that. It's the fact that he uh, has a beard, he has tattoos, he eats vegan, blah 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 blah. blah. And then you put all the stereotypes, all my stereotypes of uh, being a, of what what the hipster is. It's important that the, the these stereotypes can vary from people to people. So this is a um, uh, this is highly contextual, but this is basically the basic construction that I'm going to use. And this is, has been proposed by Franz Berthold. It's, there's nothing new there. And you can give them um, semantics for this construction. And Franz actually has, give, has given various types of semantics. For the purpose of this talk, I will be content with actually the first one he gave, which is in terms of impossible worlds. So there are two reasons for that. Well, there's one, well, at least one reason for that which is that we're interested in making differences between the possible and the impossible. So it's very nice to have uh, in our models, the possible worlds and the impossible worlds being, uh, being uh, separated. Also because the, um, the kind of tools that we use to explain in which case use maxim works and in case it doesn't work so well, have to do uh, with uh, the relative closeness between impossible and possible worlds. So uh, the, the kind of, Ideas I have in mind are best presented in the uh, with the impossible words framework. Uh, what well, the only thing you need to know is that there are two kinds of impossible worlds. You have the impossible worlds that behave logically well, and those that don't behave well at all. Um, so, um, in the worlds that behave well, you can find anything true there, but everything that is true there will be closed under logical operations. There are also uh, misbehaved worlds where anything can happen and those worlds have no logic. So, I mean, in those worlds, there are worlds that violate any conceivable law of logic and those worlds are necessary if you want to conceive alternative logics so or if you want to uh, conceive failures of uh, laws of logic, this kind of stuff. So that's why they are there. Uh, I will not make use of the wild possible ones uh, much, but uh, so basically in the model you have worlds uh, possible among which you have possible uh, the intentionally impossible, so they are the well-behaved ones, and the extensionally impossible ones they are the non-well-behaved ones. Uh, the at is a uh, actual world, which is part of the possible worlds. You need to single out in your language a set of uh, sentences that will be able to give you impulse for imagination. So the assumption here is that the agents that we are modeling are not able to start uh, uh, a conception with any input. So for example, if I ask you uh, to conceive what it's like to be a bat, usually you, you are lost, to, you cannot do that. So not everything can be started. And probably if I, I have asked you uh, in 1962, I think, or 1961, uh, whether uh, you can conceive uh, through the justified belief not to be knowledge, you would probably have some trouble uh, starting an imagination like that. So I think it's important to be, to actually, it's, it's important for the story I'm going to tell that the set of admissible inputs uh, is in general a subset of the uh, of the, the set of the sentences, um, and the, the 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 semantic machinery that will explain the the logic of the enrichment of the enrichment is done by a selection function. So this is something that is um, machinery that it has been used uh, in the um, in the logic for counterfactuals. Uh, here, the, it's, um, it's a selection function that outputs a set of possible worlds, which are supposed to be um, the closest words among those where a certain sentence is true. So the key construct here is F, a binary function which takes a sentence and a world, and it gathers a set of worlds, so worlds, possible, impossible. That are closest to how I conceive the world W to be 
among those for phi is true. So you take a sentence, Axel is a, um, Axel is a hipster, has become a hipster. Consider all the possible worlds uh, where it's true that Axel uh, uh, is a hipster and you rank them according to how they uh, correspond to my conception of a hipster. And, and in all the those that are rank as the closest, that, that, have the, that, that are, that are the, the closest to my conception of the hipster, you will see Excel with the pair the tattoo in Spain. Basically, the, the way it works. And then, uh, you, so what I define is, uh, is basically the, the template of a model. And if you want to have full-fledged models, they need to impose uh, uh, conditions. And you need to impose uh, rules about how logical vocabulary behaves at uh, possible worlds and at uh, well-behaved in possible worlds. So this will hold. Uh, those are there's nothing like surprising here for conjunction to be true. Uh, both conjunctions have to be true. There's nothing like um, surprising. Um, you have some clauses for a necessity operator, which is here uh, the global necessity operator, which means that something is possible if it's true at all possible worlds. We don't care about accessibility relation here because we want the, the most encompassing notion of necessity to be possible just to be true at one possible world. And here we have the clause for, um, for verifying an act of imagination. So it's true at the world W that uh, if I start to imagine explicitly that phi, I imagine implicitly that psi. So first it has to be the case that uh, phi belongs to Kate and that this is what put. And then for all the worlds that are uh, in that set here, uh, so all the worlds that are <coughs> closest among the phi worlds from the way I present things, all those worlds will verify psi. Yes. This idea of closeness is not in semantics, right? Or no. You have to define the app that's just like. That's true. It's a, it's a loose talk, but it can be uh, justified by the further conditions on models that I haven't spelled that, spelled that yet. So, so this is a like gloss to give you the, the intuition. I but to make sure no, no, that's a, that's a very good uh, observation. And actually, in order to, to express those conditions that Justify the fact that it's a uh, it characterizes sort of form of closeness. I need to, I will use uh, this notation of true sets, so it's sort of brackets with the plus means a set of worlds where phi is true and with a minus a set of worlds when it's not true. And then you have those conditions here. Uh, so phi is true everywhere. So when I, when I select a world based on, on an input, the input is, is true in all the words. It's conserved, basically. You have some um, some rules for the behavior of conjunction that are supposed to account for the merology of the imagination. If I imagine a conjunction, I have to imagine each the conjunct separately. If I imagine conjunct separately, then I also imagine the conjunction. This is perhaps a bit more controversial, but uh, I. Berto has it and I had it too. I think there are good reasons. I mean, it's not bad to have it, I say like that. And then you have a condition of uniformity that really justifies the idea that it can be seen as a, as a form of, uh, as imposing a, an order. Um, because it's a, it creates a sort of a notion of equivalence between, uh, between inputs at worlds. So two inputs are equivalent. If uh, when I start with one, I get the other, and, I start, and then I start with the other, I get the other one. <clears throat> this is something that is a sort of condition that is uh, in the taken from the Stalnaker uh, uh, theory of uh, possible it's a, it's a very standard thing in the in the counterfactual in semantics for counterfactuals. Uh, and then you define consequence and validity in the usual way. Uh, something is a consequence of a set of uh, premises. If you should take any model and any world in that model where all the premises are true, then in that world, the conclusion will be true too. And 
So automatically, given these conditions of models, you, you, either, you, you get uh, some validities that are supposed to express uh, some, some principles about conception, the fact that when you consider <coughs> conjunction, you can see each conjunct, this kind of stuff. Um, there are also uh, invalidities that are provable, which show that it's hyper-intentional, so that we are happy. Uh, I will not spend too much time on this. What is more important is how to move from this binary conception of uh, uh, imagine, of conceiving to a notion of conceivability. Because conceivability is a, is a unary thing. It's a, you don't ask uh, whether there's connection about something implicitly conceived or... And so, so here the idea is to follow actually uh, something, a move that has been made in the literature on, uh, in literature on epistemic logic on public announcements. It's actually syntactically is expressed in the same way. So we have a public announcement and uh, she announced publicly that I can say, uh, then people can make inferences and they can deduce that, uh, that phi. But you can also uh, quantify over uh, possible, I mean, this has been done in literature on public announcements. You can quantify over all possible public announcements. And here, the idea is to quantify over all admissible inputs. So something is conceivable if there is an admissible input, which is such that if I voluntarily start with that input, then implicitly I will conceive that stuff. And that's basically the meaning of that CB3. If there is an input side, uh, then taking that as an input will be inside. And then you can recover a unary notion of conceivability from that binary stuff, which uh, nevertheless capitalizes on this fine-grained analysis of uh, conception having an explicit part and an implicit part, a voluntary part and an involuntary part. And this will be crucial to the kind of application I want to do uh, later. Um, so I guess I'm almost done, so I will have to be very quick. So I will just make announcements <laughs> and uh, not give arguments from now on because I don't have time. Sorry about that. So the first thing to say is that under this modeling, Hume's maxim fails. And hold on, this is not the, the end of the world. All that means is that uh, Hume's maxim is not a logical truth about conception, but I don't think it has to be a logical truth about conception to be an interesting principle. So uh, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, the second thing is that there are some additional principles or constraints one might want to put on uh, the selection function that governs the rules for the uh, implicit enrichment of the implicit inputs that might actually uh, get us closer to uh, the, the intended behavior of Hume's maxim. And here, uh, the idea is uh, a, a condition called the strangeness of impossibility, which is the idea that the, very roughly, but only very roughly, the idea that impossible worlds are always further away than possible worlds where we want to evaluate possibilities. Actually, there are various ways to cash out these uh, principles. There's a strong way, which is, I think, too strong, too strong, and there's a weak way, which I think is exactly what we need. So basically, for a possibility, so if I want to evaluate a possibility, I have to look uh, at the closest uh, five worlds, and there will, always be, there will always be one that is possible. So it's not possible that when I want to evaluate uh, a possibility, all the closest worlds are impossible. And this seems right it, because it seems that some impossibility among the, the five worlds, something impossible would be closer to something, would be more resemblant to something possible, which is something a bit weird. And um, and the, uh, the the main the main formal result. I mean, there's nothing deep about it. But if you put strangeness, the weak version of the strangeness of impossibility. Then you have this relation, uh, not, some, not something completely new. I think it's, uh, it's, I've seen that in the literature. I don't claim originality for this. But if you start with an impossible input and you use that principle, then you get a possible output. So, and, uh, so this is the basic building block for me to construct a notion of conceivability that will work according to Hume's maxim. 
I, and so just to give the um, the main view, because I don't have time to. Uh, so I think I have a slide where the view is explained. I think it's there, basically. So there's a notion I would I would call correct conceivability, uh, which is a, which applies to P. If there is an input Q, such that it's known that Q is possible, and the output is obtained in accordance with the transness of impossibility constraint. Uh, the idea is that correct conceivability is a regulative notion. It's not supposed to be a descriptive notion. It's supposed to be what the standard we need to look at when we evaluate applications of the method of conceivability. So basically, when I see a conceivability argument, I have to ask, well, is the, is the input really possible? Or do I have good reason to think it's possible? And when I look at the way it's, arranged, it's organized, I said, do you have good reason to doubt that uh, it has been uh, enriched by putting impossible worlds before all possible worlds. And if I check those two boxes, then I'm kind of confident that uh, the argument should work. Uh, and in the cases where it doesn't work, it's because one of those two reasons. Uh, so it is hyper-intentional uh, in case you care about it as much as I do. But also, uh, it can explain how thought experiments expand model knowledge. And this is something that is not something that will be clear to you because I haven't explained it. But the idea is that there's a distinction between easy model knowledge and hard model knowledge. So unless you're completely model skeptic, I think it's fair to say that there are things that we have at, at least justified belief about whether they are possible things about the arrangement of objects in space, uh, like easy stuff, things you are familiar with. You would be, a, you would need to be, I think, a very hardcore skept model skeptic to, to deny that we have knowledge of this kind of stuff. Uh, and sometimes uh, this sort of model knowledge is necessary to trigger, uh, to, to describe an input that would then give me some interesting goods. And the best example I have of that is the get your cases. Because, so that's where I took my example uh, earlier about 1961, so before the publication of the Gettier, the Gettier paper, people, I mean, it was very hard for people to, uh, to conceive of true the justified belief without knowledge, unless they had read Plato, but there's an example, I think, in the menu, yeah. in the Tetus, sorry, thank you. But for all people who didn't read Plato, it was very hard to conceive this kind of stuff. But what, what Gettier uh, did was to provide a scenario, the possibility of which is very hard to deny. Because it's about people like being in very mundane relation, they have information. No one would say that it's, I mean, it's very unlikely to be in such situation, but there's nothing, not, nothing like impossible about that. But once you uh, accept that as an input for an act of imagination and you enrich it, then you come very naturally to the conclusion that there is knowledge without true justifiability. So you start from easy model knowledge and you get hard model knowledge by the method of continuity. And the way, and, and when you do that, it's fair, don't, you're not in a situation where you're at the risk of putting an impossible world before all the possible worlds where the scenario is true. So in that way, you have like an example of the method that works well. And what I've been trying to propose is a model about the best case, the case, the kind of case where it works, and to eliminate the kind of case where it doesn't work. So I have a model, basic, so you can, See, you can see it as a, as, a, as, a, as a policy of good practice for a conceivability argument. You can also see it as a model of model error. So a model of like what goes, how can things go wrong? And I think what is interesting about this picture, to the extent that it's, uh, it's completely convincing because I haven't argued all about all the things, is that it, there's nothing specifically semantic about it. So it subsumes the, the pre key and cases because there are cases where you put an impossible world before all the possible ones. But just by accident that there's a semantic story. I don't think the, the story about model error needs to be semantic, like uh, by necessity or... Um, and um, so I don't have, I haven't given all the arguments, but I think that understood this way, Hume's maxim is not an empty tautology. 
but it's it's not a, it's not epistemology use business because you have this kind of thing I just presented. And also, I think it also meets uh, Beto's challenge. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which it meets it ad hominem because I've articulated the notion that Bertos understands because he basically created it. So I just add a small twist to it. So uh, it should not be mysterious. And to the extent, I mean, if then there's a question about how I can make it psychologically plausible, then I would have to to go into one of the words of the dilemma, but I have, I have argued, I mean, there, there are places in, in Berto and uh, Tom's, uh, and Tom Shannon's argument where I think there's space to disagree or to, to avoid some of their conclusions. I'm happy to discuss that in the Q and A if you want. Uh, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Um, I wish you want to take five minutes of pause, or if you can just... I don't need five minutes of pause, but... Okay, so we can just question them. Does anybody have a question? Uh, Peter is in the dining room, he has questions. I don't know why I already asked questions, so please, others go ahead. Do you want to ask questions? Okay, Jean-Louis. Uh, good question. I have an impression. Uh, uh, um, yeah, thanks a lot. This was really great. Um, so, it's maybe not essential, but at the, the beginning when we talked about the Schrodinger's cats, yeah. um, uh, so it seemed to me that the conceivability there um, for, for, it to, for, for it to be in any way um, makes sense, but leads to some sort of possibility. Um, it's not just that it's conceivable, it seems that it's conceivable as a experiment that can be set up or something. It's not just a mental uh, state that we can imagine. It's like we can actually imagine to realize it, which used to be going a bit further, right? Um, like we have, it's not just that the ideas are clear, it's that we always also have a, at least idea of how to set up the experiment and it, it, it's procedural or something mm -hmm. like that. And that seems to be very important to get to the right kind of conclusions. Uh, um, it cannot be just mental gymnastics uh, to go to the possibility conclusion. Uh, it's conceivability plus something else, or conceivable to realize or something. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Uh, I don't think I have a ready-made answer. So just to be clear, so the idea here because conservative is not there, so the conservative will be used to uh, to uh, justify premise two. Mm -hmm. um, so if I understand your question a bit more, like a, I know it's not an objection, but as a challenge or something, the idea would be that uh, conceivability is not is not stringent enough yeah. to give me the right kind of possibility. So what is why is not used maxim but some, some uh, well I guess it depends on how you, you how specific the content is if the content is uh, if the idea of like uh, executability as an experiment is part of the content the target of what you need to conceive um, then uh, I don't see why conceivability would not be a good guide for that. Because um, even if you think, so if, when you say it's not just mental gymnastics, I guess the implication or the picture there is that mental gymnastics could overgenerate. Yeah. But I the, mean, that, that would be like the usual sort of arguments against humans maximum, right? That we can 
Sure, so but uh, are, uh, but the the my res my response to that is that uh, the the right way to understand it is to understand it as constrained in a certain way. And I gave the uh, the basic principle governing the constraint, which is the principle of stringency of impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy to see when the clear counterexample and the clear good examples. Uh, retrospectively, so to speak, that the constraint is respected or violated. The obvious objection is how do you apply it in the first place when you have to discuss a case that isn't clear? And here I think the, the answer is not better, neither better nor worse than when you use the uh, relative uh, uh, comparative possibility or comparative closeness as a heuristic to evaluate counterfactuals. It's not, a, it's not a perfect heuristics because there's an element of vagueness. So it's, there's nothing, I think, considerably different uh, here than in the case of counterfactual, but it's not completely useless in the sense that if there's a clear violation, you will be able to detect it. And uh, uh, so I don't think it's completely uh, purely post hoc rational reconstruction. Slightly, I think it answers a slightly different question than the one we started with, but you seem happy, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Any more question? Um, thank you very much for the talk. Could, could you explain a little bit um, the scope, the range of the city disparities class? Ah, yeah, yeah. That? Because after that, I, I thought I understood after that you explained it's highly contextual, blah, 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 and now I'm confused. Oh, you're right. I didn't exp I actually I didn't say anything about satiric paradigms. I don't think I even pronounced it, even though it's written. So, thanks for giving me the opportunity to correct that uh, that mistake. Um, so the satiric paradigms case expresses um, 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 so all things equal. equal so. The all things equal is uh, my beliefs assumption in a certain context. Um, so the selection function is something that, so this is a mechanism that governs what will be enriched and how. Uh, this is supposed to be specific to a certain context where I, uh, and so, in, I mean, here I'm giving like philosophical ex explication, explanation of the framework. I don't know if, Franz Berto will agree with everything I say, but in the way I picture things, uh, there are some aspects of this which are like uh, internal, they are like beliefs. There are things that are more or less high wire about the way I see the world. And there may be elements that are based on like uh, assumptions I make uh, in, the, in a certain situation, in a certain conversation, because I want to interact with people or so. Those beliefs plus those uh, those contextual, contextual assumptions, to the extent that they are kept fixed, there will be regularity in the way things are implicitly enriched. So that's the sense in which it is ceteris paribus. If I change my mind about what hipsters are, if I get a, like a different view, ah no, it's this is so 2010. Now in 2020, hipsters are completely different. Uh, they they happen. No, they shave themselves. Uh, they have removed their tattoos and uh, they eat meat. I don't know. Uh, so if I make that, that update in my conception of, uh, of hipsters, I will change the way I conceive my friend Axel when he becomes hipster. Um, so the all things equal, it's the context which is more objective than just your belief. Your Presume belief and mm. together. Yep. Okay, that, that's that's a strange use of this particular again. I understand better. I think it it comes from a. a, a this, it's not it's not the same. It's, it's not continuous. Or at least I don't see clearly the continuity with the use of ceteris paribus in the discussion of scientific laws. If that's what you are after, but this use of ceteris paribus was used by I think priests. And Berto about conditionals, or okay. the talk about ceteris paribus conditionals, because those and it's for conditionals that are non-monotonic. 
So in the sense that uh, everything's equal, uh, um, that will follow from that. But if you add further information or if you change the context, this might change. So that's that's the basic idea. Thank you. No questions? So I have to question myself. Uh, so it's a third to process, so I'm not sure if it's really relevant. So one question would be, um, so maybe this kind of idea that uh, this relation to possibility and possibility is uh, context dependent, as you say. So can we do it uh, in a way that like in, in case of um, uh, scientific communities, testing who belongs to the particle the community by simply looking at who recognizes the uh, experiment as basically useful. So if you, if you are like in a Korean scheme, you could define the if you have a matrix as uh, people who recognize a set of uh, experiments as being extremely useful, would you possibly this uh, both way kind of? Uh... Yeah, so I thanks a lot for uh, for bringing this to the table because uh, when I was super ambitious about these ideas and I wanted to make like real applications because basically the, the thought experiments they are just like a source of examples, but they are, ideally I would like this framework to be able to say stuff about. Uh, issues in the, the interpretation of that experiments. So one thing that I'm interested in, I still don't know exactly how to how to apply this framework to, to this kind of issue, but th those, those are the issues of counter thought experiments. So there's one thought experiment and people see, have an intuition about what would happen there. And then someone else uh, arrives and says, no, no, in that situation, something completely different uh, should happen. So uh, historical examples of this are the Newton bucket and the interpretation by Newton and the interpretation by Mach. I suppose the, the case of, uh, the, so this is the first of physics would correct me if I say something wrong, but in my understanding of uh, the use of Schrodinger cathode experiment, so at first it was used as, a, um, as a, an antagonistic thought experiment against the uh, Copenhagen interpretation, but then it became like a tool to um, to distinguish various solution to the measurement problem, and so and of course depending on what your assumptions are about the foundations of quantum mechanics, what what the way you enrich the situation described by Schrödinger in the first place will go we might go in different directions. Uh, so I mean, this is something you can express with within that framework. I mean, it's cheap in the sense that the framework is context dependent, so there's context dependency. So I don't know if you gain a lot of insight into uh, uh, the specific uh, dynamics of uh, schrodinger cassel experiments, but at least you have a framework to discuss uh, the sort of phenomena where people agree on the, on the input, but disagree on the output. Uh, something you can represent I don't know if you can explain it, you can provide a good explanation of, but at least you can represent it, you can use that framework to describe it formally, which I think is a good thing for the framework. So if you learn about your mission, I know that you've done a bit of uh, philosophy, would you, are you planning to do something about uh, this kind of ideas? Uh, I, surprisingly, not. Surprisingly not, but uh, perhaps I should. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a good case for this kind of research. But... Yeah, I mean, this is a, um, no, I mean, this research is really about a uh, framework for reasoning generally about the validity of Hume's maximum. So when it works, when it doesn't work. And usually when I do experimental philosophy, it's really to, uh, to do the anatomy of a specific intuition. So it's super specific. And uh, I haven't uh, used so far, uh, actually in Denmark, we did that with uh, Sam Schindler. We used also uh, experimental philosophy to discuss the general model of, uh, of thought experiments. Um, but that was more like some, I mean, I, of course, I, I mean, I'm a co-author, so I, I, was in the, I was on board, but I think it was Sam's approach to, uh, to try to tackle this kind of general issue with thought experiments, whereas I'm perhaps a bit more uh, I would say not conservative, but um, in the, the most recent work I've done in, in experimental philosophy was about like really uh, dissecting sort of intuition, see what are the factors that drive it. 
um, whether it's reliable, how far it generalizes, this kind of stuff. Thanks. Uh, for I have no question, but if someone else has questions. Uh, so it's it's very interesting that it's like Jung's maxim would not be a tautology but something with content, I guess, uh, in a Wittgensteinian sense. Um, but content about what? Uh, about the world, about the metaphysical nature of the world, about our ability to conceive. Um, about the meaning of conceive. Yeah, so that's a very good question, and I think the answer I want to give uh, is it's about what is required for conceivability to be a guide to possibility. So it's it's a tautology. It's a bit, so this answer is a bit tautological, mm -hmm. but it's not completely tautological because it means that uh, this connection is not for free. Okay, it's not a tautology, so it's not something you get for free. Uh, and I guess this accounts for part of the the feeling of people who say, "Well, conceivability. I mean, who are you to deny that what I uh, that, I'm, that I'm not able to conceive what I can understand clearly based on just like the my understanding of, of uh, the English language or French language, if I read in French. How dare you say that I'm confused or that I don't really consider it? And of course, the idea is that, well, uh, it's about a certain way conceivability is used to track um, possibility. And this idea is also uh, very, uh, very much accepted by people in the philosophy of imagination who distinguish creative uses of imagination from cognitive uses of imagination, where the idea that we constrain imagination in a certain way. So the content of Hume's maxim, in the way I, I really like, the, I, I never thought about this consequence of the claim that it's, I mean, my claim of being happy that it's not a, a logical truth. Uh, so it has a content. And that content is, um, so you can see it as a difference between mere representation based on understanding within a sentence and uh, modally guiding representation. And what does the work is transcendence of impossibility uh, and possible. So there are th those two things that, that, that are responsible for, 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 for it to work properly. So uh, I haven't said much about strangest of impossibility. So it's something that came out as a um, as a constraint on counter possible reasoning, but it's a controversial principle. I mean, what is controversial? I mean, a lot of people, I mean, the, the citation I gave by Nolan, where he says it's intuitive, immediately says that, well, there are counterexamples. So the a view which I think is the received view, but I'm not sure actually. Uh, but I think it's a, the received view is that it's a, it's a reasonable principle, but it's, it's not true all across the board. At least there are some uh, there are some examples. So there are pres there's pressure for me to uh, to say something about uh, the fact that it's not a universal principle because a very straight story would be to say well this is a this is a this is a, a stable I mean well-founded principle for the evaluation of counterfactuals in the presence of impossibilities in the presence of impossible worlds. So in order to track um, possibility when we conceive uh, in the possible presence of the representation of impossible states of affairs. This is the answer to the problem. The story has to be a bit more complicated uh, because of that. And so, um, as you can see, I take the opportunity of the Q&A to fill some part of my talk. But then I feel pressure to say things about the counterexamples and to explain why there are exceptions. I think there are exceptions become they occur in some very specific contexts that are reductio-like contexts. So there are contexts where you assume something impossible. So it's not a surprise that impossible worlds will come before possible worlds, uh, even though the uh, the, um, the antecedent is itself possible. So that's the story I want to take. So so I don't want to deny the fact that uh, those things are assertable. 
and I don't want to cook up a story to say, no, no, uh, to be like revisionary about, like, I can accept the idea that in some contexts, uh, but I would say that those contexts are deviant with respect to the purpose, to the, to the purpose of, of asserting possibilities as opposed to ascertaining impossibilities, which is what we do in, in reductio reasoning. This is probably the most controversial uh, part of the uh, of the argument, something which I, for which I expect most resistance from the reviewers, <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, uh, that, that's what I, I need to uh, I need to to, to find the, the right balance and um, and the right arguments, the right considerations to uh, to, uh, to to convince people who are skeptical about. Uh, uh, this the strangeness of the weak strangeness of impossibility constraint for those reasons because it's not stupid reasons those are like, important reasons so i need to address them in a meaningful way yes okay so i have still questions um one of which should be uh there are, there are some, there are some uh, impossible situations that need it's impossible for the element that need to be maximally fruitful in the debate of philosophy, like uh, Shoemaker's argument about the fact that you can have time about change. Uh, how does it uh, compute this kind of thing? Stuff? Because it seems to be uh, outside of the boundaries of your talk, or? Uh, I would need you to remind me perhaps about the. Um, the, uh, what do you mean by impossible here? So the, the idea was that uh, if you take a world and you freeze a part of it, you would have uh, the other part changing and uh, you, the part that was frozen, if they defrost, they don't see the change happening or something like that. I don't remember exactly how it is. But yeah, it's clearly a situation that is not uh, vaguely possible. That's impossible uh, only to physics that you know of, at least. Yeah, so it's not physically possible. Yeah. Okay. Mm. No, it's completely within the purview of the framework uh, because the notion of the model space is a, uh, what is, the f well, let me put it that this way. The framework is supposed to, uh, is designed in such a way that those cases should be representable in it. Uh, there's, also, there's however a difficulty about uh, the application to thought experiments in physics and I'll explain why, is because in physics, uh, what matters is uh, probably a restricted notion of possibility, which is uh, then the problem is that then you have like a lot of theoretical assumptions that you need to bring in, and uh, I don't see those have to be to be. I mean, I don't see like decisive reasons to go one way or the other when you design the framework. So one big question is whether you accept uh, metaphysical, uh, poss um, metaphysically possible, but uh, physically impossible scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, whether if you accept that, your, your model space will have a certain shape, and if you don't accept that, it will have a different shape. And the analysis of these kind of examples will depend on that. Um, so, for example, if you want to discuss the conceivability for uh, laws of nature to change or uh, the possibilities of, of, for the laws of nature to have been otherwise, uh, you will have to make decisions about the, the fine-tuning of the framework, whether how you conceive the relationship between metaphysical modality, how you express it within it, because what we have so far is just like a set of worlds, uh, and the, the, the constraints that uh, are put on those worlds are mostly uh, logical. Uh, so it says little about uh, how those words differ uh, metaphysically. If they could, so you, could you have a metaphysical difference between words that are, uh, are logically the same? Um, so th th those are things that need to be uh, to be added uh, or to be sought through when you want to apply the, uh, the framework to, to a certain case. So yeah, yeah, it's something that that. The framework allows you to, to, to describe this kind of stuff, but it doesn't force you to do it one way or the other. And, uh, and uh, the results you will give in the analysis of specific thought experiments will depend a lot on the choices you make 
so we should use accessibility relation to model uh, physical uh, necessity, physical possibility. What properties do you give to this? Uh, and the framework tells you, well, you can do it this way, you can do it that way. Then you have to find the good arguments to be uh, probably as general as possible, so to be as uncontroversial as possible if you want to design a framework, but you want it to represent something that everyone will accept. Um, so, so that's so. In that sense, the, the, the framework doesn't say anything very specific about uh, about this kind of stuff. Hopefully, it provides a, a framework to to say more. Um, one thing I was interested in, and I, I I don't know enough the literature about idealization to have something like um, to to know if if the, my intuition about this is uh, even like uh, um, sensible. But it seems to me that some some, um, some thought experiments that rely on uh, idealizations when you remove certain type of forces or you remove some such types of physical effects, uh, they take you to physically impossible worlds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then, uh, uh, if you if, if the whole reasoning remains or at least includes this kind of like. Uh, Physically possible worlds. How can you use that to uh, to something about physics? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So uh, I guess uh, I don't know if this particular framework would be useful for this kind of because I think this is a issue of like uh, the context sensitivity of, of representation. Probably does not matter the most here, unless you believe that idealization is uh, something that. Context dependent, and maybe uh, I think it's mostly a question for people who analyze thought experiments by means of counterfactuals. Uh, but in any case, the problems are similar uh, because you want to. Question is which part of logical space or modal space are you in, and which part you need to be, where, where you start, where you get at the end, and where you need to be to have a result that matters for the theories you want to discuss. So. Um, so the issue of idealization uh, is something that I still need to get a good grip on. So to put a moving practice or some kind of thought experiments uh, that you apply in some kind of idealness? Um, I, I see the argument that uh, simulations are kind of thought sort of experiments, like uh, numerical simulations, but for moving practices where you have a proper uh, system to model. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it in the other way around, okay. which is to, I don't think, I mean, I think many thought experiments involve idealizations in the sense of, sense of minimal idealization, which is to, uh, to, to bring in as few uh, material as you need to make your argument. Okay. But because you leave things out, like frictions, for example, or you are in a not. Only, I mean, it's not only fictional in the sense that it's uh, it's not in the real world, but it's also fictional in the sense that it's not uh, it's not. In if you think that if you think of laws of physics as laws of nature, outside the you you remove some some parts of the governance of the laws of nature. Of course, if you mean that's a different story. But you, it's not just fictional in the sense of uh, out of this world. It's just an out of physically possible world. Okay. Yeah. Trying to get yep. the drones that could be interesting in your mm -hmm. framework, the difference between approximation and idealization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because idealization are like exactly like you said, they are impossible world physically mm -hmm. that you use to represent the world. But some some scientist says, no, 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 I don't do that. I do approximation. So it's incorrect description of the actual world. But most of the time, it looks exactly the same. same. <laughs> it's really the interpretation. There, I know that some philosophers say that there's a special case where idealization and approximation could be distinguished. But from your point of view, it's very different because you will build the possible world in a different way and the argument in a different way. I suppose. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, there are many options uh, about how to cash this out. So thanks, I mean, I was thinking uh, about uh, different things uh, about it. Uh, 
but it's too less in my mind to communicate them linguistically to you. Maybe after a few years later. Um, no questions? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I was thinking about how uh, central the idea of closeness was and similarity and so on. Yep. Given that it doesn't figure in the models themselves, so that it's like the reading of it, right? By um, uh, so, well, and I have a, a thought, but it's based on memory, so it could be uh, a misremembrance. And when I see the shape of the models, I'm, I'm starting to doubt about it. But there's a so there's a sort of like there's a formal fact. I was about to say mathematical fact, but it's so it's not very interesting mathematics. So it's not, but there's a question whether you can define from the selection function uh, a partial order uh, or, or 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 a relation of comparative possibilities. So give me a, give me a world. And give me a sentence, uh, which is uh, admissible. Can I uh, describe or can I define uh, uh, an order relation, uh, a partial order relation, on the rest of, on, on, on the world, on, on the set of worlds? And if formally this can be done, so if I can define the relation that has the, like the required property, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, then there's a clear answer to your question. And I think I've, I remember working on that, but I don't remember if I, and I got this result, but I don't remember if I got it from this, uh, sorry, from this definition of model or a slightly more, a slightly stronger one. And now it seems a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit maybe too weak to get to that. This rather weak. Yeah, um, exactly. You really want your impossible worlds to be all further away than. Oh, but this is a different question. I think this is a different question. So there is a question whether the, uh, the the selection function imposes an order on worlds, given uh, a world and the uh, and the statement. Mm -hmm. So whether this ordering is defined, so that so this is what is required in order which we to say like uh, literally a minute that uh, f. Uh, of phi and w gathers the closest worlds to my conception. So in order to be able to say that, I have to be able to, to show that this this relation, this order relation is definable. But this is the first step. And then comes the second question, which is how does like the model status of the worlds interact with this relation? So is it the case? So is there is it the case that uh, for all let's say possible uh, inputs is it the case that uh, the closest worlds are always just possible? And if that's the case, you satisfy the strong version of transit of the possibility. I'm pretty sure that this doesn't hold uh, just by, so that's why you need to discuss additional constraints like transit of the possibility. So, I'm pretty, so here, I mean, you will not get things like that just from this sort of stuff because it's not sensitive to, uh, to model status. Yes. So you will not get, you don't, I don't see how you could, could emerge. The, 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 I mean, the, but the first question I think is an important question and I, I will have to solve it uh, when I go home, because it's, uh, it's whether this is uh, enough to give an order in. That's, is that central to your story or not? No. I think it's central. I mean, I think it should be uh, because um, I really would like to uh, have, uh, to be able to take this closeness uh, Think seriously, because otherwise, uh, I mean, if, if there's no relation of closeness, then even the notion of uh, uh, stringent of impossibility is uh, is uh, it's not well founded. It's in, it's in my imagination. And if you want to talk about uh, words being closer than others, you need to have a to have a real relation of comparative possibility out there. So if not, if I'm not able to define it, then it's just loose talk, and uh, no, it's not good. But you could just use another framework. No, like I, I mean, less, like just David Lewis with the impossible world. Yeah, yeah, no, sure, no. Then so so it's not the end of the world. It's just that this particular 
uh, modeling needs to be a bit enriched. Um, I think in any case that it should be enriched for the logical part. If I want to uh, have uh, an interesting logic of conceivability, uh, this definitely is, is too weak. So for example, this is too weak in the sense that uh, the conceivability of uh, P or Q will not be equivalent to the conceivability of, of Q or P with, because there's no nothing that governs the behavior of this junction here. So if you want uh, this commutativity uh, of um, this junction under the conceivability of Peter and, uh, and, and other like principles like the Morgan principles kind of stuff, you need to to put them by hand in the definition of the models in a very uh, so in the case of this junction, you have to be very careful because you don't want to uh, to have additivity, for example, showing up. If you care about not having additivity, you have to be careful. So I have an idea about how to do that. I haven't like uh, checked all the details, but I'm uh, I, I think there are ways to do it. So at least I'm working on it in order to be able to deliver a logic of conceivability that is well behaved. At. Of behaved at the end, because if the idea is to formalize the notion of like to to have a formal approach, uh, and then end up with a logic where considerability uh, cool is hyperintentional, but well, this junction does, um, does not commute. I mean, what are the? I mean, I would say that the the benefits of formalization are not very very good because the, the it's clearly inadequate. So. Um, yeah. But I, this has to do probably with the fact that your RSS impossible worlds are completely unrestrained. Yep. You have, which is there to label like the weirdest thoughts, right? So uh, to be conceivable. Or not possibly be open to that case, but if you like make them LP worlds or something like that, you'll get those for free, right? Yes, but I will get I will get addition. And I don't want addition. So, uh, yeah. No, so, but I think so. There's a question about why uh, to have all these impossible walls, and you can shut me up when it's time because I can talk about this for hours. Now. But um, I think the only motivation for having these impossible walls, uh, as far as I can see, is to deal with counter-logicals uh, because those are the things that will give you uh, worlds where any logical law fails. And if you want to take up the challenge of priests, which is, hey, I can conceive. There are logics I, I understand. I know that they are like uh, not the right logic, but I can understand, I can reason about them. So I think that that's a good reason to include them in a, in a, in a logic of, uh, of conceiving. Yeah, then you should also be open to it not being a mutative disjunction, for example. I can conceive of a logic and I know logics where well, the okay. is mutative. Um, so um, here we have to be very careful. Now, I, this is a very good point, but uh, I, uh, I've thought hard about that. And so there are different viewpoints. There are the viewpoint of the, of the, of the, of the, of the ascriber of the, of the, so the logician, regulates the way we talk about uh, acts of conceiving. Uh, and if, so if the modeling is based from the standpoint of classical logic, for example, um, the question is whether uh, conceiving that A or P um, um, Will uh, is the same thing as conceiving the, that P or Q, and this is something uh, different of conceiving that uh, it's always the case that, that for all P and Q. See what I mean? So there, there's a um, so in in, the, in those cases of uh, uh, alternative logics, uh, the weirdness comes from the fact that we say something. I mean. Uh, about uh, so you can see counterexamples, um, but they will not have the form just A or B. So what we'll have is 
A or B, but not. So, what I, so when I talk about the, the commutativity of the uh, values, sorry, it's great. We have to leave, but the question is because the problem is that the, 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 if you want to have a network conjunction that gives you the variability, you automatically have that. Uh, so this could hold everywhere. And the question is why are you happy not to have that? I question. So uh, basically, if you question both, then uh, it means that there's no logic of. Uh, uh, I'm willing to. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that, that's, uh, that means that when you conceive uh, a disjunction, a conjunction, it's not always the case that you conceive also the conjunctions. And uh, I think that what we need to be open is to be uh, to the fact that um, if I consider A and B plus something else, which is that uh, uh, simplification of conjunction doesn't hold, I might not get one of the contracts at the end. This should have a model. But it's something much those acts of concealment are, are much more structured than this thing here. Um, so I think the way we represent those like uh, weird logical contents, that uh, the way we express them within that basic vocabulary, which is, basic, which is very the vocabulary of propositional vocabulary, is, this, this vocabulary is very weak to express the sort of ideas we manipulate when we discuss alternative logics. Usually, we don't care about whether a conjunction is true. We care whether a conjunction follows from the conjunction separate, taken separately. It's not something we can express just with the Boolean language. So that's why I think those things are, are not too harmful if the goal is to include alternative logics. So that would be my, my doctrine. And so I would like to impose further conditions to have this for this reason. But I'm, I'm open. I mean, uh, I think the, the the end of perhaps you will convince me that uh, even this has to go. But to have to convince me, you need to give me some uh, some concrete examples. See how you best describe them uh, in that very limited language. And uh, and if I need to remove the principle that covers that, then I think probably the end of the framework because then it's too weak to be interesting. So that's why the direction I'm going is to strengthen it to that extent. Well, one last question, maybe? Anyone else? Uh, when it's out of the field, you can tell me which is the other That's irrelevant. Uh, how much is the idea of counter representation necessary for uh, your idea of possibility? And then I have to read like, uh, the last few months about nativism, and uh, there are some ah, ideas yeah. that you kind of. Uh, perception or conscious about and you representation, we still hold this kind of idea of possibility or that's a very good question. Uh, so um, so yes I think uh, I think we we received in the, the seminar a few years ago Eric Mann yeah. mm -hmm. who's one of the co authors with Dan Uto of this kind of uh, of this kind of uh, ideas. Um, so I'm sympathetic with uh, an activism and this kind of stuff on a number of counts, especially when they want to explain uh, adaptive behavior, which needs to, uh, where we need to coordinate our, our perception and action for this is very good. And uh, I think the points they make against uh, computational theory of mind are very well taken. The problem I have is with the claims, uh, the generalization to, uh, we can account for all cognition without representation. 
And of course, uh, the obvious examples you have, I mean, but then it's, uh, when I discuss with these people, with these people and with these colleagues, uh, very often there is a, there is a, we have, we have, I came, to, I mean, one of the reasons I got interested in, uh, in cognitive science was to account for the hard stuff, like linguistic understanding, uh, like chess calculation, for example. How do you account for that? This is something that people do. How do they do it? What are the strategies to prove complex stuff in math? And for this sort of thing, how do we understand literary fiction? For this sort of thing, when you when you deal with uh, de decoupled representation, uh, I think it's hard to. I, I really don't know how to do with that representation. So, uh, but um, but I guess the the, the the inactive approach would be very useful uh, for discussing, for example, the insights you could get about physical systems by playing with physical toy models. For this, I guess they will have interesting stuff to say. And uh, to the extent that those this kind of manipulation of, of physical uh, toy models could be seen as uh, limit cases of thought experiments. For this kind of thing, I think this approach has, a, has a interesting stuff to do, but it does not really communicate with, with what I offer. And I guess my approach or the kind of approach I'm after uh, is mostly uh, interesting when this kind of stuff have nothing else to say. Uh, I don't know what the an active story about uh, about uh, Schrodinger's cat is. I know they will have s s stuff to say about the, 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 the perceptual motor, perceptual motor grounding of physical concepts, of even of mathematical concepts. But it will be super general, and they will say that the, our notion of topological space is based on basic intuitions we have about transformation, like the deformation of objects. Fair enough. But when we, when it comes to uh, like uh, Distinction between uh, I don't know, uh, 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 explanatory proofs versus non-explanatory proofs, or uh, um, the details of very abstract reasoning. I don't think they they can do a lot without mental representation, and uh, so that's why I, I don't feel like uh, it's bad for me to, to be a representationist in this discussion. And for the case where this kind of stuff can be applied for the activist uh, conception, the, the possibilities and the possibility would be almost the same concept therefore, for an activist, right? That is, because your perception is already an action, an action. I think for actions, you already perceive the possibilities of actions. So uh, that would be less of a gap between possibility and possibilities. So maybe the new maximum would be less of a concern. Uh, that, no, that, that, no, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 the part of model space that you will reach with this kind of consideration are very close. So can I sit on that chair? Can I jump on that, uh, on that table? Uh, so I guess they, they probably have a good story about what I call easy possibilities, which is something I take for granted in the account. Uh, so probably they, here they have, they, have, they have interesting stuff to say. Uh, there, there are, there, there's a bit of a literature on the uh, on the notion of affordance from the standpoint of uh, model epistemology, mm -hmm. so the sense in which we perceive versus infer possibilities. And uh, so there's a book by a colleague called Guinard de Clerc, who I think is Belgian, who's just based on that. Uh, it's a bit, I mean, it's from it has several years old, but uh, so there are people working in the model epistemology uh, in that area, but this is not the sort of phenomena I'm primarily interested in with with this uh, discussion. In this discussion. But, uh, you can do everything at once. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.